Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, and welcome to the second in our four-part series from uh, Maine Audubon, exploring the potential benefits of offshore wind energy in the Gulf of Maine, as well as its potential environmental impacts. Today, uh, our second presentation uh, called Offshore Wind and Birds, we are joined by Dr. Wynn Goodale from the Science Director at the Biodiversity Research Institute and Dr. Roberto Albertani from uh, Oregon State University. Um, before I introduce our two guests, I'd like to talk a little bit about why Maine Audubon is hosting this series. Um, more than a century of burning fossil fuels has already altered the chemical composition of our atmosphere, changing the climate we are accustomed to and throwing the natural world out of balance. Mainers are seeing these changes firsthand, uh, as evidenced by the scientifically measured three degrees warming trend in the state since 1895, a growing season which has lengthened by about 16 days uh, since 1950, and a Gulf of Maine that is warming faster than almost any other water body on Earth. Um, these changes are impacting our wildlife. Uh, moose populations are falling as the warmer winters are permitting the advancement of deadly ticks. Traditionally, southern species are showing up in Maine woods and waters, including Carolina wren, black sea bass, lined seahorse, and red-bellied woodpecker. Modeling reports from the National Audubon Society predict that if the current rate of warming continues, more than 106 of Maine's bird species will lose habitat by 2050, and some, like our iconic common loon, will be pushed out of their state breeding range entirely. Uh, we need to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, or else Maine will no longer be Maine. Uh, at the top of the list of ways to achieve this is to convert to electric energy powered by renewable sources. Maine Audubon is a longtime supporter of renewable energy dating back to at least the 1970s when our Falmouth headquarters was built with passive solar and radiant heat and continuing through our current work supporting appropriately sited solar and uh, terrestrial wind projects. The potential for offshore wind in the Gulf of Maine, especially floating offshore wind, is far greater than any other source with an estimated 156 gigawatts of energy available for conversion per year. To put that 156 gigawatt number in perspective, that is more than 70 times the total amount of electricity used by the entire state of Maine in, an, in a year. The opportunity to produce such a large amount of clean renewable energy locally cannot be ignored and deserves full study. Uh, we understand that the build out of floating offshore wind, which is still an experimental technology, would have impacts on both the environmental resource and the human use of the oceans. But we owe it to ourselves and to future Mainers to make every effort to meet our climate goals. So that's why we are launching this series, uh, beginning last week with Dr. Habib Dogger from the University of Maine. Uh, we will be hosting two additional events on following Tuesdays, and, and I hope you can join us for those. Um, next week on Tuesday, April 6th at 12.30 p.m., we're hosting bat researcher Trevor Peterson from Stantec, as well as marine mammal experts to talk about offshore wind and the marine environment. Finally, on April 13th at noon, we will be hosting Celia Cunningham, the deputy, deputy director of the Governor's Energy Office, to talk about the latest developments in the Gulf of Maine. Um, before we get started with our attendees, I just want to remind you that we are on webinar format today, which means that we cannot see you or hear you, um, just the panelists. If you have questions, please put them down below in the Q&A box, which is the two speech bubbles with the Q&A. And we're going to save all the questions for the end so we can make sure we get through our speakers today. Um, and we are recording this. It'll be available on Maine Audubon's website probably either this afternoon or tomorrow. All right, let's get going. Today we are honored to be joined by two scientists uh, working to understand and prevent turbine impacts to birds. Uh, Dr. Wynn Goodale is the Science Director at the Biodiversity Research Institute, a Maine-based organization which assesses emerging threats to wildlife and ecosystems through collaborative research and uses scientific findings to advance environmental awareness and inform decision makers. Welcome, Wynn Goodale. Secondly, Dr. Roberto Albertani is an Associate professor of, professor of Mechanical Engineering at Oregon State. Dr. Albertani's research includes aerodynamics and stress analysis of flexible structures, high performance sailboat test, testing techniques, fiber composites technology, micro air vehicles, 
biological flight mechanics, and most importantly for today's purposes, the environmental impact of wind energy. Welcome, Dr. Albertani. Thank you. Great, so I am going to, without further ado, turn it over to Dr. Goodale. Take it away. All right, great. So hopefully you can hear me and see my screen. We all good, Nick? All right, great. We're all good. Well, thank you everyone. Really appreciate you uh, joining us today. And um, I don't know if you've participated in some of the other webinars in Maine. So I'm gonna give a sort of brief overview of what's going on on the East Coast and then put Maine in a context, discuss very briefly the, um, the initiatives going on in Maine. With, uh, Selena, the governor's office will cover that more later in much greater detail um, in her presentation. And um, then focus mostly on, well, what do we know about how birds respond to offshore wind? Um, so with that, I'm gonna move on to just give a little, a little background here. And I'm sorry if some of this is review for some folks, but I think it's very helpful to uh, put the rapidly changing um, industry here in context. Uh, so if some of you have seen onshore turbines, they range in size of you know, two and a half to 3.3 megawatts or so. And you can see a picture of, of what those look like. And to some degree in most locations, so tur those turbines are limited in their size um, by some basic logistics of how you get uh, large turbine components to the project site. Now uh, with the offshore environment, because turbines can be built um, basically um, at the edge of the shore and then taken via vessel to the site, you can, you're no longer constrained on the, uh, the size of the turbines from a logistical standpoint. And because of that, offshore wind turbines have been increasing significantly um, in size. And in fact, this, um, this figure is you know, already out of date. These turbines are getting bigger and bigger um, by the day. And we're now, um, there's discussions about turbines above 12 megawatts in size. And what you're able to do with these larger turbines is we're able to get further offshore and reach um, into the greater wind resource. And so there's generally this sort of movement of getting further offshore and there are advantages to doing so from a production standpoint, because uh, generally speaking, the further offshore you go, the more wind there, air, there is. And in some, but certainly not all cases, being further offshore starts to um, reduce conflicts um, in different ways. Uh, so where's the wind? This is a map that you may have seen already, but it's just worth um, pointing out again, is that uh, a majority of the best wind in the United States is actually up in New England and in the Gulf of Maine. And that's why there's interest in um, the Gulf of Maine for offshore wind and it's um, up and down the East Coast as well. So if you're uh, keeping an eye to the news, there's a lot going on in the offshore wind world. And yesterday, the Biden administration made a, a pretty significant announcement of A, signaling strong um, support from the White House moving offshore wind forward, establishing a 30 gigawatt by 2030 um, goal. The Vineyard Wind final EIS has come out. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can check that out, but there is a significant amount of movement um, forward to the south of us um, in the Gulf of Maine and offshore wind. There are um, eight leases um, off of Massachusetts and Rhode Island, um, and you can see vineyard wind there in the middle uh, of that lease area. And as we move down into New York, um, the uh, blue area, is owned by Equinor and that now has a power purchase agreement. So that project has some uh, real movement moving forward. And one of the uh, announcements, let me go back actually, one of the announcements that came out yesterday is those purple areas you can see there, those are called call areas. So those, this is in the center um, image here of this map. Those are areas that are sort of generally being considered um, for offshore wind with the understanding that they need to be refined. And something that uh, came out yesterday was these areas starting to be refined and they will probably continue to be refined as we go forward. And then there are viable projects um, going all the way down to North Carolina um, right now and leases that um, are currently owned um, 
and moving forward in various ways. Uh, further to the south, these are more call areas. And um, as far as I'm aware, I don't think there are leases yet there. Um, and as you may remember from that wind map, you're starting to get down into um, areas where the wind speed is not as high as up to the north. Uh, just very briefly for um, what's going on in Maine, there's a lot of different things that are going on. Um, going back to the Baldacci administration, it was established to have a five gigawatt by 2030 goal for the Gulf of Maine. That is uh, not likely to be met, um, but that goal is, is out there and there's been various efforts through time to, to try to move towards that. Uh, right now, there's several things going on that's uh, just worth knowing about. Um, at the highest level, there's interagency task force that's in uh, sort of is nascent right now, but will uh, over the next five to probably seven years, so it's going to be a longer process, is a multi-state effort to identify one of those sort of larger wind energy areas like we see to ourselves somewhere in the Gulf of Maine. Um, so that's a uh, federal state um, effort. Uh, then we have the Maine Offshore Wind Initiative. And this is, comes from the state and from the Mills administration. And so the key component of that moving forward right now is this roadmap effort. And the roadmap effort is really looking at offshore wind from 360 degrees and um, thinking through everything from supply chains to job creation to environmental considerations on how can the state best, best approach this. Um, there has been discussion, I'm actually not sure its current status about a 10 year uh, moratorium of offshore wind development in state water. So that's out to three miles. Um, then there is the uh, main research array and there's been various workshops ongoing about this and Selena, um, I'm sure will provide more information about this in her talk. Uh, and this is an effort by the state of Maine to um, identify a 16 square mile area within this area of interest you see here on the map. And there's an ongoing effort, multi-stakeholder effort right now to identify areas with least conflicts. And the idea of this research array is that it's going to be a project of, you know, approximately 10 turbines um, and it will be set up um, so that there could be various research efforts to help understand specifically how floating offshore wind in Maine is influencing different resources and be able to use that in order to inform future um, projects. And then finally, there's the Maine Aquaventus project, which is off of Monhegan. I'm sure you heard more um, about that last week from Dr. Dogger. And that's a one turbine project uh, that is uh, through a DOE um, initiative, and that is a demonstration project. And for those of you interested, if you just go to Google and type in Maine and offshore wind, it'll take you to the Maine um, offshore wind website, and here's a link to it. it. Can give you much more detail on what's going on. So, what are the kind of the key components here of offshore wind? We have the turbines, we have cables that connect um, the electricity between the turbines and then eventually to a substation. From that offshore substation, we go um, a cable to an onshore substation and then to the power line. So, on one hand, there's sort of it's sort of fairly simple conceptually, but each one of these components. Um, are areas that when we think about birds that we want to be aware of how these could um, birds would interact with these different phases of our different portions of, of the projects. Um, some of the key things here in Maine is the traditional type of foundation that is used is a monopile or jacket foundation. And this is um, essentially where you have um, you know, I sort of think of it of, of taking a, a nail and driving it into the seafloor and on top of that you put your, your turbines. But in Maine, our water is so deep and uh, so quickly that we really are going to be looking towards floating types technology. So semi-submersible types designs like um, what University of Maine is working on that is anchored with catenary lines. There's some other options of tension legs and um, spar buoys. So what you're probably most interested in here is, well, what do we know about um, the effects of 
of offshore wind on birds and wildlife. And I'm gonna focus really here on birds, but we're also dealing with an ecosystem. So there's interaction that occur um, above water and below water. Um, probably what comes to mind um, for most folks is um, that there's a potential for collisions. So this is where bir birds and bats can um, collide with a, the turbine blades themselves or the, um, the support structures. Um, it's important to note that the actual number of fatalities that have been recorded offshore are very low. Um, it's also important to note that, as you may imagine, this is a very hard and difficult thing um, in order to monitor successfully. Uh, there's also been um, some research um, in Europe, and we'll get some more details on that, on a certain set of birds are really um, have strong avoidance responses to um, turbines and that avoidance response can have two potential effects. One is um, a displacement, so um, displacement from a foraging area um, or um, what is termed a barrier effect, a basically a, um, a structure that the birds have to go around during migration or on their way to foraging areas. Um, below water, um, I'd be expected that we're gonna see some um, microhabitat changes. So, these new hard substrate that goes in the water is um, going to uh, be a place for new benthic communities um, to develop um, and um, can be a place for fish aggregation. So we're actually going to be changing the habitat um, around the turbines. And to some degree, this is an area of open research of how will the birds respond to that habitat change. Um, then there's also, this is really um, more about construction of traditional pile driven uh, projects that there can be a lot of noise generated um, during that and those have the potential to um, affect um, marine mammals in particular. That's not my uh, area of expertise. And important to note that floating projects will be uh, the, the sort of the general thought is the turbines will primarily be um, constructed um, close to shore and then pulled out and anchored offshore. So pile driving won't be um, a uh, too big of a concern here in the Gulf of Maine. So I think one thing that's helpful is, um, at least for me, if you think of the sort of question of well, what are the impacts of um, offshore wind on birds, sort of big, that's a lot to digest. And there's a rule of thumb in the basic uh, risk approach that I think I found really helpful and it's looking um, at the risk in terms of hazards and vulnerability and exposure. So the hazards are, you know, what are the things that the um, birds are responding to? So that's the physical turbines, the wind farm itself, vulnerability is, so if the birds are present, if they're exposed, are they going to be vulnerable to, um, uh, vulnerable to the offshore wind turbines? And as we already discussed, there are really kind of two kind of adverse effects you want to consider, both direct and indirect. So indirect would be those displacement. So from a hazard perspective, you know, most of what we have learned about offshore wind comes from uh, uh, traditional pile-driven um, turbines. That being said, is probably the bird response, the above water piece, is probably relatively similar. Um, what are potential differences? There might be a different type of reef effect that occurs. Um, so that's the um, uh, where uh, fish might be attracted to the turbines. There might be a different type of reef, reef effect that occurs both here in the Gulf of Maine and also through a floating structure. Um, are there greater perching opportunities? Um, and a really important note, and we'll get into this in a little bit, more is that a lot of what we've learned about avoidance comes from smaller turbines in Europe and the turbines that would be considered here in the Gulf of Maine are going to be much larger and spaced much further apart. So how does that factor into avoidance behavior? Um, also here in the Gulf of Maine we need to consider the uh, unique species assemblages that are here and also the unique uh, geography of the area. So when we think about vulnerability to collision, um, these are difficult things to monitor offshore. Um, and the way that researchers have approached this are sort of twofold. One is directly trying to um, actually detect 
um, collisions themselves. Um, and um, Roberto is going to talk more about this and how to approach this. Um, but this is an area of ongoing research um, and is a, a, um, a challenging area. There's also been research around um, trying to understand what are the behaviors that make a species more or less vulnerable to collision. So understanding um, flight heights um, and their flight speeds and basically also how many birds are going to be in an area and really importantly avoidance rates. So displacement is an area where there's actually been some very helpful studies that have given us an idea of which um, species are more um, likely to avoid projects um, and potentially be displaced by them. When we talk about avoidance, we, we talk about it in sort of three scales. Uh, we have um, macro, which is a avoidance of the whole wind farm area. Meso, which is avoidance of individual turbines within a offshore wind farm, and then micro, which are those last uh, sort of moment avoidance responses that occur around the structure itself. So from a macro avoidance um, perspective, there's been um, some uh, really seminal studies that done in Europe of looking at loons and sea ducks in particular, um, and also um, ox and gannets that have looked at done some pre-construction work and post-construction work with a before after gradient type design. So that's where you're surveying a much larger area than the wind farm and you can look at how species distribution changes before and after. And so you can see here from the Mendel work for loons and this is red-throated loons, the before and after um, of loon distribution with sort of that blue area being the concentrations and green areas being lower. And you can see that loons really are not particularly interested in being near the um, offshore wind projects at all. And in fact, they can uh, initiate avoidance response as far as 16.5 uh, kilometers away. And we've seen similar types of results for sea ducks. Looking like I'm kind of running low on time. So I'm just gonna sort of go through these last couple of slides and then there'll certainly be opportunity for us to um, have a conversation and ask questions in a bit. Um, there's also some evidence to suggest for some species this idea of a barrier effect. So during migration that the birds are going around. Um, it's important to note for both um, uh, displacement and barrier effect is that we have some pretty good idea of this response, but what the potential impacts of that response remains um, a bit unclear on energetic consequences, fitness consequences, and ultimately will be a really difficult thing to, to get at. As we look at here at the Gulf of Maine, um, we have a really complex and dynamic ecosystem with um, some really unique qualities that we're both have Southern and Northern species. We have listed species. We have uh, breeding seabirds here that aren't nesting to the South. And we also have migratory um, birds and bats that are actually um, expected to be crossing um, across the, um, the Gulf. This, this map here that we see here first is um, the MDAT maps of all species put together that shows you sort of overall higher and lower use areas that are predicted for 47 species. We can also look to um, models developed from tracking data. So this is Northern Gannet. Um, in the fall and um, shows their higher and lower use areas as they're moving through this area during migration. Uh, more and more we're learning about how birds are crossing the gulf and um, we now have pretty good information about falcons, songbirds, shorebirds, and bats potentially moving across the gulf. And um, some of you may have seen this, but I think this is a pretty um, interesting new finding that we, uh, my colleague, um, Chris DeSorbo at BRI, uh, put satellite transmitters on peregrine falcons and we track their migration across the Gulf of Maine and we can see them moving right through uh, across the Gulf of Maine. As we um, start to consider the area of interest, um, we have a variety of useful tools from the Northeast Data Portal and this all um, comes from these uh, bird distribution uh, models are developed by NOAA. And we can see uh, varying use of the area by state uh, list of species, uh, species with higher uh, collision or displacement risk and rosy tern, which is certainly of particular interest because it is a 
listed species. And I think with that, I will finish up. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Goodale. Um, and we will turn it over to Dr. Abutani. Remember, we are saving all our questions at the end. Please put them into the Q&A box below and uh, I will stop talking so we can continue on. Thank you, doctor. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, okay, so I hope that everybody can see that my screen, the presentation. Um, well, thanks first to Maine Audubon, to Nick, to organize this thing, a great presentation from Dr. Goodale. It was very interesting to know what's going on on the North East Coast. We in the Northwest, uh, Pacific Northwest, we are also active with uh, offshore wind energy and the wave energy, by the, especially Oregon State. Anyway, um, I'm gonna start right, right away. So this is just a brief uh, outline. I will gonna cover a, um, a, a summary of uh, two plus one project that have been funded with my team by the Department of Energy about uh, uh, detection of birds, a certain particular species that we will see applied to golden eagle or eagles, and uh, how to eventually deter them from getting too close to wind, wind turbines. And finally, the, 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 the main part of this project was how we can automatically detect events on blades, uh, wind, turbine, uh, wind turbine blades. Uh, very briefly, uh, wind turbines are uh, very uh, uh, machines that are quite large and uh, they could be at uh, with uh, a vertical uh, axis uh, shaft or horizontal axis shaft. The one on the sides of this uh, uh, slide are vertical shaft, the one in the middle is horizontal. So the shaft is spinning about the horizontal axis which by the way now is the most popular, uh, almost the, the only type of turbines that are out, out, out there. But just a, a brief perspective of history of engineering of wind turbines. There was a time that vertical shaft was uh, popular and thought to be a, a good, uh, uh, a good uh, solution. Turbines are not almost never by running by themselves. They are um, organized in clusters or arrays or wind farms. These are just few, uh, few pictures on a, on a um, few uh, arrays um, of wind farms. The, the, the turbines on the left, and I will talk about that particular turbine, turbine fuse lights, is a GE 1.5 megawatt that is installed at the, North, the North, uh, National Wind Technology Center uh, run by NREL, DOE, and we have used extensively the turbine for testing our systems. Very briefly, how the turbine works, there are these uh, kind of gigantic blades uh, 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 converting kinetic energy from the wind to mechanical energy at the shaft. Uh, the shaft, there are actually two shafts and there is a gearbox in between. There is the low, shaft, low speed shaft uh, attached to the uh, main, uh, to, to the rotor. The main shaft runs through a gearbox. The gearbox multiply the shaft speed, which is needed to run the electric ge generator. Uh, as far as uh, uh, a 2.5, typically, a typical um, wind turbine size now is about two, 2.5 megawatt. We have therefore a rotor diameter of about 100 meters. And uh, more important for our work, it means that the 50 or so meter long blade uh, with a uh, uh, um, low speed rotor shaft spinning at about 18, 20 round per minutes, it means that the tip of, the very tip of the blade runs at about 200 miles per hour, 225 miles per hour, which is 360 kilometer per hour. So that's one of the main risk factors for birds and bats that are uh, flying around. Those big blades that seems to run very, very slowly, they are indeed slow, but the, uh, the, the 
velocity or the single uh, uh, section of the blade at the tear can be much higher than that. Where is the, um, who, who in the world is producing most of energy? This is a 2015 uh, slide uh, data from uh, DOE. Uh, there is, um, it was the United States were now no, number one, second to uh, second is uh, China. I believe that now is a uh, reverse, but uh, if we, this is the total production of single uh, uh, countries. If we look at the pro capita production in 2012 data, uh, Denmark was num number one and uh, followed by Spain, Portugal, and this is the anyway, the, the plot that show the pro capita, pro capita uh, production of wind energy. Where the wind energy is, I'm gonna skip this slide because Dr. Goodell already gave a presentation about where the wind energy mainly is. Of course, this is the same or similar map from NREL that shows the potential of wind energy offshore and particularly the Northeast coast of the United States, north, uh, Northwest. And of course there is the tornado alley in the center of the country where it's not as high as offshore, but still is a high concentration of wind energy. Um, so what is the motivation of our, my team work? Um, we need to find out if blades are uh, causing damages to birds or bats. On land, as probably most of you know, is uh, the, main, uh, the main way to understand and to do statistics is just look for carcasses on land, which is or already give uh, some uncertainties due to scavengers, uh, 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 all these carcasses, uh, if they are, they may disappear for just the, the weather or scavengers. And of course, it's practically impossible to do the same methodology offshore. So there is no carcass count offshore. So how we can uh, uh, try to understand statistics on uh, blade events? That's exactly one of the three uh, uh, the, one of the three steps that we are they are going to present in this work. Uh, the 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 first part of our work uh, again funded by D DOE was specifically tailored to eagles. That was the main scope of the uh, funding and uh, everything that I will show about uh, detecting a, a bird coming toward the turbine is focused on eagle. But as, as I will explain in a few slides, the same system could be trained to detect and, and recognize and, and, and identify basically any other species of bird or bats. Uh, so um, the three-step approach are target detection and identification, deterrent, and the blade impact automatic monitoring. So having an automatic system that will tell us with a very high uh, probability of uh, of uh, uh, detecting if the blade stroke some, some kind of object during the motion. Um, how the overall system is organized around the turbine. Again, this system has been tested on the ground, in the lab on the ground and on the GE 1.5 at the National Wind Technology Center. So we have a 360 degrees field of view, single camera on top of the turbine. Basically, we have a field of view that is all the way around the turbine horizontally and 180 degrees vertically. So it's, it's one camera that look at all the air space around the turbine. And this is used for uh, two things. First, and I will show a, a slide in, 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 a, in a few minutes, a general uh, understanding of the fly, fly activity around the turbine. And then it will specific, specifically be used to uh, detect an eagle coming toward the turbine. Then we try to design a system that will deter or, um, or uh, uh, frighten 
eagle coming too, too, too uh, close to the torba, which is very difficult, by the way, to scare eagles uh, away, but we try. And then finally, there is the blade uh, number three and number four. There is our um, detection on what's going on at the blade level. And, and I'll, I'll show in a few slides how we do that. So we have a single camera that the, in the in palm of the hand is a commercial uh, weatherproof 360 degrees ca camera uh, installed on the top of the, of, of the turbine. And uh, uh, this camera will again view all the airspace around the turbine, 360 degrees horizontally. That's how that picture on the on the second uh, arrow shows what is the view from the camera. Remember, we are looking at everything around us. Uh, on the right, there is the, um, uh, the, an eagle, a golden eagle, that was specifically the, uh, the objective of this project that we have been using to, um, uh, to train an algorithm that will, uh, number one, recognize if there is a moving target in the sky. Number two is that moving target is coming towards and closer to the, to the turbine. And finally, try to identify the species. How we do that? Well, I'm not a special computer specialist. I am aerospace and in an aerospace engineering all my life, but uh, I have colleagues at Oregon State that are specialists in uh, image, uh, image uh, data processing and the recognition. So they've been using algorithms that are a sort of uh, uh, artificial intelligence. They are called deep convolutional neural network. Basically, it's a very complicated algorithm that is able to recognize things from uh, and from others what is the main uh, uh, the, the, the main uh, 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 action that this algorithm need training and for this we went to the two locations oops two locations in or Oregon where we have uh, where we have uh, where there are um, uh, golden eagles that have been saved in, in the past and been trained. So we've been flying those two golden eagles over and over and over, taking videos with the camera, the same camera that is on the top of the nacelle of the turbine. And this is a, just one example of the video with the eagle flying by the camera. Remember, this is a 360 degrees. So we are looking everything everywhere around us. Uh, the next slide will give you an example on how the camera will look at the scene on top of the turbine. We, of course, never ever fl flew any bird, train or not, train closer or anywhere around the turbine. So we flew uh, train golden eagles in the field in their own area, two different areas in Oregon. Then we took videos, uh, example of vi videos on the top of the turbine, and we match the two videos to train the algorithm to recognize things. And more videos we have, and more and uh, better trained the algorithm would be. So now we are assumed that uh, the system works and we have indeed the 90 plus percent of uh, true positive and the temp about uh, 10, 15 percent of false positive and, uh, and the 90 and so percent of uh, true ne negative. So we are assuming that we have a system that can recognize a bird coming is indeed an eagle. What we do then? Well, there are several ways to avoid troubles with the bird coming around the turbine. One typical way that we do not, we have not uh, 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 tested is uh, shut down the turbine or put the turbine in a low energy mode. So basically we spin slower or just shut down the turbine. 
is not very desirable for several re reasons, like of course loss of loss of energy, <clears throat> and also we put the the blades and the ro and, and the rotor in a sat in, in a, with more loads, which is not ex exactly the best way. So we we think we thought to study the the feature that. Uh, uh, Eagles are annoyed by anthropomorphic figures around the ground. So we thought to use uh, what we call uh, kinetic um, kinetic deterrent, which is basically those uh, wind socks or uh, wind dancers that you can maybe see typically on uh, outside the car dealer. So we we have studied design a system that can run several of these wind dancers with different colors. Colors were selected with the, uh, from another uh, team sponsored by DOE to study the physiology of the eagle. So they suggested us colors that, uh, according to their studies, their research are the most annoying for eagles. So we can run a certain number of kinetic on 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 the ground. We did a lot of tests in the wind tunnel at OSU on the on the van just to see how they this uh, wind uh, this uh, deterrent rea reacts with uh, wind, and uh, we can run a number of them in random way, and these will be uh, these are uh, run automatically by the computer system when the camera and algorithm detect the wind the an eagle is coming automatically the system will start to run all these, these deterrents on, on the ground. We file a scientific collect, collection permit with the Oregon Wildlife and, and, and Idaho Wildlife. So we did some two test campaign of these deterrents in the presence of wild eagle with all the permit and everything. We were just not harming anybody. We just were, we just, uh, deploy one or two the 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 terrain when the wild eagle were flying around we have a sort of uh, relatively positive results but uh, in the end after two the de deployment in two different um, in the same area in Oregon in the two different time of the year we really could not tell there was not enough data, not enough tests, not enough encounter to really tell if the deterrent will make uh, a, a difference. Uh, so we have now a system that can identify a species coming, specifically a, a, an eagle. We could have a system with the 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 terrain, but the, the the core of the of the problem is okay. Whatever system you have to deter or whatever system you have try to avoid impact like shutdown or whatever other uh, uh, idea you have to, to look at the interactions between birds, bats and turbine, what is the real effective, effective result of that? So we need something that will, uh, uh, that will detect if the blade uh, had any impact with, with, with something. Uh, so we, we had the idea to use the vibrations on blades, vibration that will be induced by an impact of the blade on something. So of course, vibration uh, runs along uh, a solid, the blade is a solid, and because it's a fiberglass with some carbon fiber inside for the large blade, but mainly fiberglass, the fibers conduct vibrations very, very well. So we put some sensors at the root of each blade. The sensor will monitor continuously for vibrations on the blades. And with other specialized algorithm, we will be able in real time to detect if there was a spike in vibration that probably was due to an impact on the blade. So vibrations are the key measurement for us, the spike in vibration will activate automatically a micro camera that uh, is uh, on the same sensor, the, that is a, a picture on the bottom right. The, the, all these sensors are in a box. The box 
as also a micro camera looking at the leading edge of the blade, like the picture on the on the top right. Uh, so, and the camera continuously uh, mo monitor the blade, but only when uh, only when uh, there there is a strike detected by the sensor. Uh, I will tell to the camera and to the computer to save a certain number of frames of the video before and after the impact. Those frames, like the one at the bottom right, is a frame automatically saved when the, uh, the blade at the GE 1.5 in Boulder, Colorado, the, at the National Wind Technology Center had the strike with a tennis ball. Why tennis ball? Well, because we need a, we need some way to, to, um, to uh, simulate bird impact on the blade. So my students had a really, really fun, I had the fun too, to design a cannon, an air compressed cannon, or I think it's called potato launcher or potato gun or something like that. So with that cannon, we were shooting uh, tennis balls and small potatoes toward the rotor and we had a certain number of events and the, 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 the graph on the bottom left shows an example of uh, the vibration, the continuous vibration recorded by the system because blades are continuously affected by vibration from the normal turbine operation. But when there is a strike, there is a spike in the vibration. And again, we detect uh, automatically that spike and the camera on board, this is a, a just a, a recording. This, by the way, is another GE 1.5 at the, uh, at the uh, um, community college in, in New, New Mexico that we also use for testing. So the camera is continually looking at the blade like the, the video there, but only when the strike is detected, the, um, the images will be saved for species recognition and event confirmation. So species recognition is fundamentally important, of course, for in our system. Uh, moreover, for specifically for uh, um, uh, night birds and bats, we are right now is a new project experimenting, and we are think that we will be able to deploy this new system in mid-May, again, in Boulder, Colorado, we will have a high resolution infrared camera mounted on the rotor blade that will uh, operate similarly to the daylight cam cam camera, uh, but specifically for uh, nocturnal vi vision. And finally, the same 360 camera that is on top of the nacelle will also be used as a general um, general air space, uh, uh, general um, um, surveillance around wind to turbines. And with this, I, I think I conclude my presentation with this eagle detection, deterrent system, and more important, blade event automatic detection system. And uh, with this, I think I can uh, close my my talk and uh, open for questions. Excellent. Is your Thank name. you so much, Dr. Albertani. Thank you so much, Dr. Goodell. Uh, let's uh, take some questions now. And I, I would like to uh, invite my colleague, Eliza Donahue, if she would like to be on for this section in case there are questions about Maine Audubon. Um, let's just dive into it. First, uh, Dr. Goodell, if I could ask you to Talk a little bit more about what's known about the threats to uh, migratory, say, passerines, smaller songbirds and things over the Gulf. Are, are they, um, what do we know maybe about the, the heights that they fly or the, um, the sort of the threat that turbines may pose uh, in the Gulf? Yeah, great question. Um, so thinking back to that sort of simple risk matrix, the couple of things we want to consider first is so exposure, when are the birds out there and how are they out there? And um, we uh, certainly know that some species like black pole warblers are going to leave the Gulf of Maine, uh, the coast of Maine over the Gulf of Maine and fly um, south down to 
uh, Caribbean and areas down there. Other species may be making those kind of jumps across the Gulf that we saw um, with um, like the peregrine falcon map that I showed. So we certainly know that the species are out there. Um, how are they differentiating their use across the, in the entire Gulf? Are they using some areas more than others? I'd say that's an area that we don't have a lot of information. I think the assumption is that there's going to be greater use for some species closer to shore, but you will get those sort of cutoffs um, going across the, um, the Gulf. As, as some of you may know that um, there's different ways to track wildlife and learn about them. And songbirds are so small that we can't put satellite transmitters on them that give you that detailed information. But there's been some really interesting work with a kind of technology called um, MODIS tags or nano tags. There's these tiny little VHF transmitters that we can put on the birds and um, their signal gets picked up by receiver stations that are set up around the Gulf of Maine. And there's been research on songbirds um, uh, that's gone up and down through time, um, going starting actually over on uh, Nova Scotia and down through the Gulf of Maine. So we have a sense of that the birds are moving around. One interesting thing though, we think of migration in our head as this sort of directional continual movement of birds just, hey, they're all heading south. But some of the things that we've learned in um, this nanotag work is that the birds do all sorts of weird things, right? Um, uh, so another way that we can learn about their use offshore is weather radar or next rad radar. Um, if any of you have checked out unfiltered next rad radar on a uh, evening when there is um, in September and there's a cold front after a rainy period, it's pretty amazing to see what looks like this eruption of like thunderstorms um, along the coast of Maine. And that's where we're seeing songbirds starting to move offshore. Uh, so we do have sort of some general understanding of their movement offshore. So to the question of flight heights, that's a hard one. Um, there's some radar work that was done on Monhegan um, in which we saw differential use through the air column of, of um, songbird use, but that's likely to be different offshore. And, um, you know, Adrienne Lepole of the IFNW, who's considering this a lot, one thing she thinks about is how the birds are ascending and descending from the islands. So the further that you get from shore, the assumption is that the birds are getting higher. So they're going up um, and their altitude of flight is going to be relative to the weather. So in those sort of traditional cold fronts, um, the assumption is the birds are probably getting pretty high. They're getting up there and they're cooking along. The areas of concern happen when those birds have been hunkered down for a while because of poor weather, they're heading out um, and then another system comes in um, that pushes them down. So they're gonna, as a cloud cover comes in, they're gonna be becoming lower. Um, how does that put them at risk is, you know, remains an open question offshore, but certainly one of the important things is reducing lighting. Um, as we know, these birds evolved to navigate using a variety of cues, but they certainly evolved with having only the moon and stars as lighting out there. Um, and so when there's, um, and there's many records at, um, at uh, lighthouses of um, uh, migrants being attracted to lighthouses. So uh, large white lights are not good at all. Um, and um, some of the work in Germany at FINA 1 saw a lot of attraction of some songbirds um, to an area that was really lit up. So we're able to really uh, minimize those potential effects by reducing lighting at the turbines themselves. And the good news is that the traditional FAA lighting that is flashing reds um, are lights that the birds are attracted to us. And that's probably more than you wanted, but I will. That's fantastic. That's, that's really important. Um, uh, Dr. Albertani, I have a question here from Sally about, um, do you think your detection cameras can catch smaller birds or, um, how do you see, you know, use a tennis ball in the test, which was interesting. Um, and how do you think that those land-based tests might transfer to offshore sites? Oh, thank you for the questions. Uh, cameras can uh, 
uh, we are now experimenting cameras with higher resolution and of course you know the uh, uh, the evolution electronic or of electronics so fast that uh, the answer is uh, yes. I think we can definitely uh, catch uh, any size of birds actually just by using the proper camera. Maybe more, uh, we are now using more than one camera with different re resolution and fi fi field of view. Problem is uh, camera supposed to be triggered by the spike uh, of, the, of, the, of the event and the smaller the burr or the lower kinetic energy or the lower speed of the blade, the spikes gonna be lower and lower. Uh, the, the, the ultimate solution would probably be having the camera running continuously, which again, with the, the, mod, with the uh, evolution of electronic, we can compress the data. Uh, so definitely small birds and small bats, yes. And could be also used in nighttime with the infrared, uh, cameras and uh, we don't think there will be much difference between land and offshore for all these systems it will be just a, a difference in the in the, in the, in, the, in environmental con conditions but uh, i don't think there will be any any fundamental difference in the systems excellent thank you um question f more of a general question i think for, for dr goodale um as we are moving forward with you know, research turbines in the Gulf and uh, a research array coming up. Do you think that we will know what we need to know? In other words, do you think that the, um, what do, what, what should the turbines or what should scientists make sure we look at as we are inter entering these research and test phases um, to make sure that we are uh, accurately understanding the impacts to birds and then eliminating them, mitigating them, et cetera? <laughs> a great question um, and um, a long conversation, but um, there are certain things that we can learn without structures out there through surveys and some of this, um, some types of tracking. But for some species, we really need structures out there in order to affix various sensor equipment to them. And so I think that's sort of two helpful ways to think about this. What can we learn in the absence of structures and what can we learn with structures in place? And in the absence of structures, we can um, get a baseline understanding um, of what birds are out there when through sort of traditional um, survey methodologies. And that's um, very helpful. And in the Gulf of Maine, we really don't have recent information on this. And um, this is an important thing that we collectively need to do in this space is to get new baseline data. We have a hodgepodge of data from 1978 to present through the Gulf of Maine, but it's, um, and that's what's been used in these predictive maps, um, the MDAT maps that are available on the portal. So that's helpful, predictive models are helpful, but we really don't have recent information here. So number one, we've got to get some baseline surveys. So secondly, then the question is what, what can we learn from a research array? And I think it's helpful to think about that first in a technology, monitoring technology testing phase. So taking the kind of technology that we heard from, from Roberto and thinking, can we test that out on a research array in the same way that NREL um, allows access to turbines, that kind of access is um, not necessarily um, even possible in commercial scale projects. So having access to test different technologies, being able to manipulate the, the turbines themselves, attach things to it, all sorts of things that are just not gonna be that feasible in commercial projects. So that's number one. Uh, number two, having technology out there so that we can learn about say what the activity of nocturnal migrants offshore. Um, well, obviously, when you're doing basic survey work, you're doing that during daylight hours and getting information on those nocturnal migrants is not really possible. So uh, having sensor technology out there, some of the nanotags that we talked about is really important. And then maybe the last piece to consider is sort of the ecological side, is considering the relationship between what's going on underwater and above water and having interdisciplinary studies that help us understand that relationship. Because one of the tricky things with anything like this is that you can do your best to predict what's going to happen, but you're putting a novel structure in the water and that's going to change what's happening out there and it's gonna change how wildlife are responding. So 
and, and we have unique species and unique situation here in, in the Gulf of Maine, and we need to use the research array in order to learn um, uh, on these uh, uh, initial turbines, how wildlife are responding. So that as you move forward to more commercial scale projects that you can take what's been learned, such as things like spacing. As you change spacing, does that allow for corridors of movement for birds between the turbines and starts to reduce this concern about displacement and habitat loss? Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Albertani, a couple other questions about um, detection or avoidance possibilities out there. Um, one is that the, the possibility of using sound uh, to uh, potentially cause avoidance. And, and another one is, uh, is there an option for potential avoidance measures that are sort of running continuously, not maybe waiting for an event or, or birds to come near? All right. Um, thank you again for the questions. Uh, sound, uh, yes and no. Uh, our work, and, and I, I am an engineer, not biologist, so I, I just read things about uh, the turn for birds, and it, it turned out that sound will not work for eagle. And again, I say eagle because that was the specific objective of our study. Sound may work for our, our other birds. Is actually there is a very famous, I learned, company in Oregon, close by where we are here. That is, a a that is specialized in making sound deterrent for birds and seems to be very successful with uh, certain bird species for crops, uh, protecting crops and other things. So sound for certain species, I understand, is certainly a possibility. Of course, we need to think about the scale. Wind farms and wind turbines are so vast and so large that generating enough sound for those big, uh, uh, large, areas uh, I don't, uh, could be a little kind of cha uh, cha challenging. Uh, so sound, I would say yes or no. Uh, running continuously, the monitoring, uh, yes, is a certainly a possibility, but running videos for each blade continuously generates an enormous amount of data and it will be problematic to uh, process or to store those data for a continuous uh, mon monitoring. As I mentioned, with the improving technology of uh, memory and uh, algorithm that will compress the data, it could probably be an option instead of uh, activate the video only when an event is uh, detected. So, Yes, it's probably a possibility in the near future to have a, a continuous running uh, video. So Excellent, later. thank you. Yeah. So I'm aware of the time here and I want to take just one more question. I, um, I urge you, if you have additional questions, to email them to me. Um, I can put my email in the chat um, because there are a lot more questions. The other things I will say, and my lights are flickering for some reason, um, uh, I will say there are some questions here about other things that can be done in the Gulf or other measures that are taken. Um, I encourage you to register for the additional presentations uh, in our series. So next week we have a presentation on benthic communities and marine mammals. So you'll learn more about what happens underwater and under, you know, on the, on the subsurface. Um, and then finally, uh, the governor's energy office, uh, Celia Cunningham is joining us on uh, April 13th. Um, and that's a great time to ask questions about, um, you know, other things that can be that we will learn from the research array and how we make sure we are we are re uh, you know researching those things and asking the right questions. So um, please join there. You can just go to Maine Audubon and, and register for those programs. Um, we'd love to have you. Um, that I just I guess I want to ask one last question for for Dr. Goodale, which is about what about birds diving underwater? Um, is there any potential threat there and um, or other understanding? Yeah, great question. I want to just uh, follow up on the deterrent question too, very quickly. And please, please. Um, I, uh, birds are really smart. They habituate quickly, and um, you know, I think one of the the great things about Roberto is showing is having novel things that shock the birds so that they see something new and respond. So if you have things running continuously, the birds are more particularly uh, birds like gulls are very smart, and they're going to become accustomed to it. And also more anecdotal, I heard that, you know, this is a real issue at airports, right? Um, and uh, I heard 
a whole variety of methods, of, you know, I think it was the Navy, they spent a ton of money on this. And what they found out was the best deterrent was to have somebody walk with their little terrier around the periphery of the airport every so often. And that was more effective than any light show or sounds or anything else um, at deterring birds. Um, so that sort of that predator uh, out there is what helped. So um, I'm sorry, Nick, what was your, what was the question? Um, Underwater birds, diving birds. Underwater, right. Um, so, you know, I think that um, a lot of the birds that are, are diving birds, some of them are the ones that um, avoid projects. So your, your sea ducks, um, your gannets, your ox um, are species that tend to avoid. Um, something that has started to show up in European projects is um, sea ducks will initially avoid projects, um, but then as the new, new food resource becomes available to them, they can be um, attracted in and potentially be foraging on uh, mussels that are available um, now at the base of the turbines. So I think this is like one area if we think about the research array is understanding um, how things change through time and how birds are going to respond to that through time. It's, you're not, to do a study just in um, the first several years is going to be very helpful, but one thing that the research array can allow for is longer term studies and look at how changes of that ecology around those turbines are going to affect foraging opportunities for the birds. Um, during construction for traditional pile driven, you know, the sound attenuation um, probably what's going to happen is the birds will avoid the area um, as will prey. So they're probably going to avoid that potential hazard. Um, so that's a great area for continued research as we go forward. There is much to learn. Um, thank you very much to both Dr. Albertani, Dr. Goodell for your presentations today. Or I really appreciate your time and the work that you are doing. Um, everyone, thanks for joining. Uh, it's great to have you on. This video will be available on our website soon. Um, and please join us for our two following presentations. Um, thanks again to our presenters and have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye.